I started writing when I was very young, when I was a little girl. Uh, and I knew that I wanted to put words together in a way that was, that I wanted to try to be wonderful with huh. words if I could. But I didn't know that that would make me a poet. As a, a little girl, I was a stutterer. I uh, was one of those children who went, ah, 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 ah. by the time I finally finished the sentence, everyone had disappeared before my eyes. So I, there was a lot of silence around me. I went to college for a couple of years. I went to Howard University for two years and uh, lost my scholarship, got married. I have six children. I had them in seven years. Because I was a stutterer, um, I was sort of by myself and alone a lot, and people sort of put me into corners someplace, and uh, I read, and then I started to write. Uh, in the quietness of, of being by myself alone and people not wanting to listen, I started to write. So sometimes I would write what I wanted to say. I would write it down on paper and pass it to people. So someone finally said one day, oh, Sonia's writing poems, I think. I was always writing poems. I was published because, and I was over 30 years old, because I read in a, what was called at that time Negro Digest about Robert Hayden. Wonderful poet. And I've always been a great reader, so I knew these names. And uh, uh, Robert Hayden at that time had been part of the National Endowment for the Arts. And I thought, gee, this is a black guy. Maybe I'll send him a poem. For me, this was so bold, you wouldn't believe it. And I sent poems to Robert Hayden. He wrote back a very nice letter. He also gave the manuscript to Carolyn Kaiser. I didn't know who that was at that time. She's now a good friend of mine. Uh, Carolyn took them to the Poetry Center of the YMHA. I won the Discovery Award. I'd never heard of the Discovery Award. I had never heard of the YMHA. I thought they were wrong. I said, this is a misprint, YMCA, everybody knows it. I love teaching, although sometimes I wish I could, you know, just get one year off just to write and read. Preferably just to read sometimes. You know, the reading that we do is, is always reading for work. But I love my students. You know, it's um, something to walk into a classroom of 40 people or 50 people, you know, and, <laughs> and bring them into an arena of literature, uh, an arena that says simply that they can think. We have waited a long time for this generation looking at me. You know that? Oh, have we waited for you. But we haven't waited for you just to look pretty, you know? Mm -hmm. we've, always, we've had generations before you looking pretty, you know? I'm talking about we waited for you because you have information. You will be a generation involved with things that none of us have ever been involved with in terms of, like, the kinds of things that from computers, whatever. I mean, you are dealing with some scientific stuff that no one has ever dealt with before. Imagine that. And you hold the key almost to this universe on many levels. But unless you're human with it, you're talking about death. You're talking about holding the key to death and destruction, people, real destruction. And we have got to talk about not training you necessarily in the classroom, but making you think about what it means to walk on this earth and like this earth. What it really means to like yourself also, too, and to love yourselves. To love yourself so much you don't want to exploit anybody. You know that? Can you imagine not wanting to exploit anyone? Huh? Isn't it something to raise 18-year-olds and 19 and 20-year-olds and say that we're not going to send you off to a war any place? You're not going to learn geography by going to war? But you don't learn geography in this country. We know that already, okay? You know. But you learn where Korea is, and you learn where Vietnam is, and you learn where Nicaragua is, and you learn where Panama is, and you learn where the Middle East is. Because we send you off to war and say to you, fight. Fight for oil. Fight for all those natural resources they have there, you know. No. I'm talking about reality, people. Wouldn't it be something that you could raise, be raised in this country and never have to pick up a gun and fight? Don't tell me that I'm talking an anti and anti-country thing. Come on, people. This is my country. I'm talking about talking something that is human, finally. I'm talking, talking about something, finally, that is talking about humanity, about people who will look up and be born and know that you'll, you will live as long as you can live and you will not be shot in some foreign place or possibly not even shot here over drugs. Come on. I mean, we've got to envision peace. We have got to think peace. We have to have those people that we elect and put in the so-called White House, okay? And said, in no way, no, 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 you want a war, why don't you and the other person go fight it out? Not, we're not going to fight. We don't want to fight. We don't believe in war. We believe in peace. 
and human justice, finally. That's not easy, because people want to call you a red, you know, call you crazy, call you anti-America, you see? And we said, no, we're all Americans here. But what we are simply is that we are talking in a very real sense about finally dealing with this earth. Because you see, I was on a panel once with a scientist, you know, I was listening to him talk about what was going on. I said, you know, one day the earth is going to give up on us. It's going to look up, look at us, these great humans, you know, walking upright. And the earth said, you know, I'm willing to get rid of all of you. I mean, give, give you up wipe you out and wait millions of years for another species to come along because you are so destructive. And I refuse to give up this earth, as I said to earth molesters, and I refuse to give up this earth also to people without vision. I said, some of you looking at me, students, understand what it means to go into an economics class and demand that people begin to talk about another way of looking at this earth, another way of making money, Another way of making money that we don't need to go to war to get out of depression, people. Make those people who teach economics think of another way to keep us out of depressions, okay? You know, we come out of depression quite often via, via wars. You know, let's fight a war and then all of a sudden we have great success in this country economically. There's got to be another way to do this one. And it's up to you also, too, to begin to challenge those people who teach you in these classrooms, you see, to come up with other theories of how we can live in peace. But above all, it's important that you understand, too, what it means to envision peace, finally. That no, at 18, you don't have to register and then go away and fight a war. And watch the men. Watch them. Watch how invigorated they become. You know, usually when they talk on TV, they're so drab, you know, like, yes, I want to say it. But when they talk about war, look at them. Yes, we show them. We would tell them what they must do, whatever. They become real, real, real invigorated, you know, I'm sure. And that's probably the one time they don't go home and beat their wives. Uh, I've been in California almost four years. And, uh... I am very fond of the Pacific Ocean. I think that's a great ocean. And I was talking to a colleague at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and they were telling me that, no, the Atlantic is the best ocean. And uh, I think that tells you something about the high literary conversation that we have at the University of Santa Cruz. We discuss this sort of thing. And I wanted to, it was hard for me to explain how a person of my complexion might feel about the Atlantic Ocean. Though I am also aware of the feeling that a person of Asian complexion might have about the Pacific Ocean. But anyway, I decided to do a poem about it. Now, this poem starts with the words that we used to sing in the Baptist Church. I have discovered a truth. The truth is that there are not a lot of Baptists in America but it is full of ex-Baptists. I am an ex-Baptist. There are groups of us all over the country. Anyway, this, this starts with a song we used to sing. Them bones, them bones will rise again. Them bones, them bones will walk again. Them bones, them bones will talk again. Now, hear the word of the Lord. Atlantic is a sea of bones. My bones, my elegant Africans connecting Waida and New York, a bridge of ivory. Seabed, they call it. In its arms, my early mothers sleep. Some women leapt with babies in their arms. Some women wept and threw the babies in. Maternal armies pace the Atlantic floor. I call my name into the roar of surf and something awful answers. This piece is to my grandmother, simply called Dear Mama. My father bought a picture of her one Christmas, said her name was Lizzie, but I said yes, but we used to call her Mama. Dear Mama, it is Christmas Eve and the year is passing away with callous feet. My father, your son and I decorate the night with words, sit ceremoniously in human song, watch our sapphire words eclipse the night. We have come to this simplicity from afar. He stirs, pulls from his pocket a faded picture of you, black woman, sitting in frigid peace, 
all of your biography preserved in your face. And my eyes draw up short as he says her name was Elizabeth, but we used to call her Lizzie. And I hold your picture in my hands, but I know your name by heart, it's Mama. I hold you in my hands and let time pass over my face. Let my baby be. She ain't like the others. She rough. She'll stumble on gentleness later on. Ah, oh, Mama. Gentleness ain't never been no stranger to my genes, but I didn't like the roughness of running and swallowing the wind, diving in rivers I could barely swim, jumping from second-story windows into a saving backyard bush. I didn't love you for loving me so hard until I slid inside your veins and sell your blood to an uncrucified shore. And I remember Saturday afternoons at our house, the old sister Dignesses sitting in sacred pain, black cadavers burning with lost aromas, and I crawled behind the couch and listened to breaths I had never breathed, tasted their enormous martyrdom, lives spent on so many things, heard their laughter as Sister Smith's latest performance in church, her purse sailing towards Brother Thomas's head again. And I hugged the laughter round my knees, draped it round my shoulder like a Spanish shawl. And history began once again. I received it and let it circulate in my blood. I learned in those Saturday afternoons about women rooted in themselves, raising themselves in dark America, discharging their pain without ever stopping. I learned about women fighting men back when they hit them. Don't never let no men hit you more than once, girl. I learned about women waking up their men in the night with pans of hot grease and the compromises reached after the smell of hot grease had penetrated their sleepy brains. I learned about loose women walking the abandoned walk down front in church, crossing their legs instead of their hands to God, and I crept into my eyes, along with my daydreams of being woman, adult, powerful, loving, like them, allowing nobody to rule me if I didn't want to be. And when they left, when those old bodies had gathered up their sovereign smells, after they had kissed and packed up beans, snacks, and cakes cooked and laughed a bag, after they had called out their last goodbyes, I crawled out of my place, surveyed the room, then walked over to the couch where some had sat for hours and bent my head and smelled their evening smells. I screamed out loud, ooh wee, ain't that stinky? And I laughed laughter from a thousand corridors, and you turned, Mama, closed the door, chased me around the room until I crawled into a corner where your large body could not reach me. But your laughter pierced the little alcove where I sat laughing at the night, and your humming sprinkled my small space, your humming about your Jesus and how one day he was going to take you home. Because you died when I was six, Mama, I never laughed like that again. Because you died without warning, Mama, my sister and I moved from family to stepmother to friend of the family. I never felt your warmth again, but I knew corners and alcoves and closets where I was pushed when some mad woman went out of control, where I sat for days while some woman raved in rhymes about unwanted children and work and not enough money or love, and I set out my childhood with stutters and poems gathered in my head like some winter storm, and the poems erased the stutters and pain, and the words loved me, and I loved them in return. My first real poem was about you, Mama, and death. My first real poem recited an alphabet of spit, sprouting a white bus driver's face, after you tried to push Cousin Lucille off a bus, and she left Birmingham under the cover of darkness forever. My first real poem was about your child's white arms holding me up against death. My life flows from your mama. My style comes from a long line of Louises who picked me up in the night to keep me from wetting the bed. A long line of sorrows who fed me and my sister and 14 other children from watery soups and beans and a lot of imagination. A long line of Lizzie's who made me understand love, sharing, holding a child up to the stars, holding your tribe in a grip of love. A long line of black people holding each other up against silence. I still hear your humming, Mama. The color of your song calls me home. The color of your words saying, let her be. She got a right to be different. She gonna stumble herself one of these days. Just let the child be, and I be, Mama. Uh, my father used to say to me, Lucille, you are not the first Lucille. Which I knew, right? The first Lucille was the first black woman legally hanged in the state of Virginia. 
I don't know what to say. Should I say thank you? You know, I don't know what to say to that. But he would go on to tell me the story of the one who was called Caroline. Now, I say called Caroline because very few people were born on the African continent in 1822 named Caroline. Uh, she was born among the Dahomey people in 1822, kidnapped and brought to this country in 1830, landed in New Orleans, walked in a coffle from New Orleans to Virginia, and sold to a man whose name was Bob Donald. And so she was called Bob Donald's Caroline, or Caroline Donald. She was trained as a midwife, and she worked in an orchard. There was also a slave who was called Uncle Sam Lewis, Sale. He was a slave too old to work. He had been born in this country in 1777, and he'd been a Christmas gift to the family that owned him. I always wonder, I mean, my mind is quirky, right? I always wonder, a Christmas gift, where was the bow? I mean, where do you put, like, the, do you, you know, I, don't, I have no idea. That must have been a logistical problem. Anyway, he was a slave too old to work. Now, he must have been pretty old because they didn't have social security and stuff. But he couldn't do nothing, and so he drove his master, who was blind, in a carriage. One day, they were driving by an orchard, and Uncle Sam Lewis saw Caroline, and he asked his master if he would buy her for him, for his wife. Now, you say, what did he want with a wife, right? Slave too old to work, please. But anyway, she was bought for him, and they had seven children. Uh, perhaps some stereotypes are true, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, they had seven children. The oldest was called Lucille. After the war between the states, a man named Harvey Nichols, a white man, came with his family from Connecticut to Virginia, he was a carpetbagger, to make money uh, on the South's tragedy. I now have to say it is alleged, it is alleged that Harvey Nichols saw Lucille and she had a son by him. I say that because half of American history happened and the darker half allegedly happened. Uh, she had a son called Jeannie. The child was born with a withered arm. When the child was less than a year old, Lucille waited, killed Harvey Nichols, was tried and hanged. So this is a part of this, this story. Uh, this is, first part is my father's voice. I try to read it in my father's language. The second part is my own young language, which is my mother tongue, so to speak. And the thing for you to remember, first of all, remember all the stereotypes that none of you know, but you've heard vaguely somewhere. And also remember that my blood great-grandfather was the white man named Harvey Nichols. Okay. Yes, Lord, he was born with a withered arm. And when he was still just a baby, Lucy waited by the crossroad one night for Harvey Nichols to come to her. And when he rode up on a white horse, she cocked up a rifle she had stole and shot him off his horse and killed him, Lou. And she didn't run away. She didn't run away. She waited right there by the body with the rifle in her hand till the horse coming back empty saddle to the stable brought a mob to see what had become of Harvey Nichols. And when they got to the crossroad, they found Lucy standing there with the rifle in her hand. And they didn't lynch her, Lou, cause she was Mammy Caroline's child and from Dahomey women. That's what I believe. Mammy Caroline got one of the lawyer's sale family to defend her daughter cause they was all lawyers and preachers in that family. <clears throat> They had a legal trial, and Lucy was found guilty and hanged. Mammy Caroline took the baby boy Jeannie and raised him and never let him forget who he was. I used to ask her sometime, Mammy, was you scared back then by Grandma Lucy? And she would look right at me and say, I'm scared for you, mister, that's all. She always called me mister. She said I was Mr. Sale, and Lou, I always was. Later, I would ask my father for proof. Where are the records, Daddy? I would ask. The time may not be right. It might just be a family legend or something. Somebody somewhere knows, he would say. And I would be dissatisfied and fuss with Fred about fact and proof and history until he told me one day not to worry, that even the lies are true. In history, even the lies are true. 
And there would be days when we young sales would be trying to dance and sing in the house, and Sammy, my brother, would miss a step and not be able to keep up to the music, and neither one of us could ever learn how to dance. And he would look over in the corner of the room and holler, damn Harvey Nichols, and we would laugh. <laughs> Shirley Bell, Du Bois, by Delaney Lumumba, Septima Clark, Bobby Sands, Queen Mother Moore, Black Sash Society, Nkumba, Whitman Brooks, Sterling Brown, Margaret Walker, Angela Davis, June Jordan, Mr. Michaud, Audrey Lord, Malcolm, Malcolm, Malcolm. We are here. Because while some countries pay lip service to an anti-apartheid policy, they continue to invest in that apartheid economy on the racism defines of UN resolutions. To the contrary, we are here to celebrate the 61st birthday of MLK, the 65th birthday of Malcolm. We are here because we have been retort the nature of those in power who would say that there are no hungry people or children in America. One who would continue to tell offensive ethnic jokes. One who would say sanctions against South Africa would deprive women of their lust for jewelry. One who would watch the rising unemployment of black youth with little comment but would comment in a loud TV voice about the prostitution of young blacks, Hispanics, fights on the Times Squares of the world as the suburban fathers step right up for their pick of black Puerto Rican white youth step right up I say step right up a good sale on black and brown and white meat today young and tender bucks right here for your bourgeois dreams going gone gone sold to the highest bidder Long Island businessman or congressman waiting in the eastern path of lust or college president stripping our youth literally of their dignity all circling the back of black Puerto Rican unemployment we are here because Puerto Rico was used as a staging ground for the invasion of Grenada then Grenada as a staging ground practice for the invasion of Nicaragua we're here to Remember, the invasion of Grenada done under the guise of restoring peace. We're here because of the continued displacement of Native Americans. We're here because Africans, Latinos, Native Americans, Asians are starving and dying in Somalia, Uganda, El Salvador, Ethiopia, Cameroons, Mississippi, Nicaragua, Harlem, reservations, refugees, all. We're here because every three days, 120,000 children die of starvation or the effects of starvation. We're here because of the children of Atlanta, the children and adults of Louisville, the rise of racism on college campuses, the detention of young brothers and sisters in South Africa, the killing of children in El Salvador. Listen to their cries, my brothers and sisters. Ah! to turn the cries 
and screams of our children into words, to words of life. We've got to protect them and love them. It is up to us to save them. We have got to organize and unite and come together. Come on, come on, come on, you can do it. Come on, come on, come on, come on, brothers and sisters. Come on, come on, come on, come on, you can do it. Come on, in Zulu's words, yeah, my dola. You have a pasta, come on, brothers and sisters. Come on, organize, unite. Come on, come on, guys from America, you can do it. You can do it. Come on, yes, you can. Get off your asses, you can do it. Come on, come on, Asians. Yes, you can. You can do it. Come on, you can do it. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. We didn't bring you here to this country to be racist. Come on, come on, you can do it. You can do it. Come on, you can do it. Come on, you can do it. Yes, you can. Come on, whites, you can do it. Drop those secret privileges. Come on, you can do it. Come on, drop the privilege of being white. You can do it. Come on, whites. Yes, you can do it. Yes, you can. Come on, Latino. Come on, Latino. You can do it. Yes, you can do it. You can organize. You're not coming together. Come on, gays. You can do it. Come on, you can organize. And you're not. Come on, come on. You can do it. 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 Yes, you can, Native American. Yes, 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 yes. Organize. You're not coming together. You got to do it. Because it will get better if we organize and unite. In my time and your time, in three words, it'll get better. eBay. eBay, yeah, yeah. Organize. Unite. Come together. Yes, you can. You can do it. You can do it. You can do it. Yes, you can. Organize. Unite. It'll get better in my time and your time. eBay. 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 Yeah, 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 yeah,